Our next session will be discussing transgender and intersex issues. For clarification, the concept of transgender most often is referring to someone who is challenging traditional gender roles. On the other hand, when I'm referring to intersex, I'm referring to a person that has been born with genitalia that does not fit the popular norm of male or female. They don't fit into what I have previously referred to as those mutually exclusive categories of male and female. So transgender does include a couple of different categories. Those that are cross-dressers, meaning they dress according to the norms of the gender that they were not born with. Transsexuals, meaning those that identify with the gender that they were not born with and who are taking steps to modify their appearance. And also gender benders. And those are people that display themselves differently or engage in behaviors that belong to the gender they were not born biologically as. These different kinds of people would all fit under the more generic term of transgender. So oftentimes someone who is transgender will refer to themselves as someone who is trapped in the body of the wrong sex. Many times transgendered individuals will seek to remedy their condition by intervention. They may have surgeries, and some of those surgeries have been common since the 1980s. Interventions can include surgery to modify the body, but also hormone therapy to modify the secondary sex characteristics, like breast development or pitch of voice, or electrolysis to remove male facial and body hair. So, to try and understand some of the different terms, in general, the following labels refer to certain characteristics. A transsexual is someone who's had surgery or other body modification. A transgenderist is a person who dresses and presents themselves as the other sex. They may take hormones. On the other hand, a cross-dresser is somebody who maintains their sexual identity but just dresses to express their feminine or masculine side. And a drag queen or king, that's somebody who dresses as the other sex. They exaggerate the characteristics of the sex they are presenting, and it's done more for attention or entertainment, and sometimes both. An important term to understand is gender dysphoria. That's the actual clinical label that's given to someone that feels as if they are trapped in the body of the other sex. It's estimated that there are about 2 to 4% of the population that experiences gender dysphoria. One study in the Netherlands, where transgender surgery is much more accepted than it is in the U.S., and where it also originated, it was estimated there that there were more male to female surgeries so it's more popular to reassign from male to female, but that gap is also narrowing. The main issue here is that when you're experiencing gender dysphoria, that your emotional and psychological identity, they don't match the biological or physical characteristics you were born with. Those that do experience gender dysphoria they often talk about the emotional pain, anxiety, and also the anguish that they experience because of the mismatch between their physical body and their assigned sex at birth. We also know that transgendered individuals have a much higher rate of victimization by hate crimes. Statistics show that of the GBLTQ community, those crimes that are committed against this community 20% of all murder victims are transgendered, and 40% of police violence was against transgendered individuals. We tend to think about hate crimes and violence when we think about discrimination against transgendered persons, but there are other forms of discrimination. Employment discrimination occurs when the person is denied employment. Even when employed, there still also may be a lack of inclusion by others 
or the person may be discharged from work. And even when the transgendered person tries to keep their identity a secret, there's always the risk of being outed by anyone that happens to find out. Having taught this class now for almost 20 years, I frequently get asked by the students, well, how does transgendered marriage work? After Obergefell was decided in 2015, same-sex marriage is no longer at issue. But let's say, for instance, that the U.S. Supreme Court had not ruled that states had to marry same-sex couples. What then? For transgendered individuals, if they have surgery and sex reassignment is done, they can then change their sex on the driver's license and all other identification. This then legally gives them the status of the new sex. So if a male were to change from male to female, then that person would not be female, and they could marry a male partner. Now, of course, this is no longer the issue it was before Obergefell, because states now must recognize same-sex marriages. So the requirement that a man and a woman be marital partners is no longer the case. We've talked about the idea already of a two-spirited, the Native American tradition of having men who display the gender characteristics and take on the roles of both sexes. The old label, or the burdash, has negative connotations to it, as it was derived from the original French word for male prostitute. So the movement has been to change the label to two-spirited, which more appropriately refers to the idea that both male and the female inhabit one person. In Native American culture, there's a good deal of honor that's associated with the role. So if there was not a two-spirited person, at least one in each tribe, that it was considered a loss to the tribe. A great example of someone who brought cross-dressing to the American public's eye was Dennis Rodman. He was a very talented, uber-masculine in many ways sports figure that not only cross-dressed, but brought it to the basketball court when he was at the height of his game. And some great, co and some great quotes by Rodman's former coach, Phil Jackson, capture some aspects of Dennis Rodman. Jackson said Rodman had reached a heart space with other members of the team he'd never anticipated. And he also said, Dennis has been a real blessing for us because he's like a Hayoka. Jackson was explaining that among the Lakota people, a Hayoka was a cross-dresser, a unique person that was respected because he brought a reality change when you saw him. But we also know that transsexuals are at a high risk of violence, and that includes when they're held in jails and prisons. The question arises, when committed to a correctional institution, where is that person going to be housed? Should they be housed with the gender that they identify with, or should they be housed with the sex that they were born into? Sometimes either housing arrangement can put a person at risk. But still, the prisons and jails have a duty to maintain a safe place for the inmates, and if the institution fails to keep the person safe, and if they were what is known as deliberately indifferent to the risk that they expose the person to, then they can be held liable for damages if that person is harmed. Sometimes isolation cells are used to keep the person safe, but the continued use of isolation can also be cruel and unusual punishments. Recently, the U.S. enacted into federal law something called PREA, the Prison Rape Elimination Act, which in part was meant to address the issue of safety for homosexual and transgendered individuals. So what if sexual reassignment is being considered by the person? Well, the WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgendered Health Provider, gives guidelines on what should occur. The WPATH is the entity that oversees physicians and other team members that would be helping that person transition. They publish the guidelines on the surgical, the psychological, the emotional, and the psychiatric standards that are to be met for proper transitioning. So when sexual reassignment is being planned, the person is first assessed by a team of professionals to see whether they are an appropriate candidate for sexual reassignment. They'll have psychotherapy sessions. They may also be required to do what's known as the real life experience, i.e. living in the new gender for a period of time. 
they may have hormone therapy, and they may also have surgical reassignment. So when sexual reassignment is planned, there's an entire professional team that meets around assuring that it's properly done. And that includes the surgeon, a psychiatrist that has the credentials of a mental health professional that is also a specialist in gender identity disorders, an endocrinologist that will address hormonal changes, a social worker to address social issues, and then finally there's the test of the real life experience. Now the test used to call for living in the new gender identity for two years, but now there's an option between three months of real life experience or three months of intensive psychotherapy.